We'll get you the sticker. All right. I have to go to plan B. <laughs> We're still learning all this. Um, good to see Miss Kay and Miss Carolyn here this morning. Um, Miss Joan Smith called this morning. She's in terrible pain um, and was uh, hurting really bad, so she's unable to be with us. She hopes maybe to make it for worship, but ask for prayers. Um, so let's remember her. And yes, ma'am. Kathy starts her chemo tomorrow. I saw where you got your port in. Everything went good with that. Chemo tomorrow. Okay, we'll be in prayer with that. I don't know how many of you met Miss Barbara Twitty's grandson, Matthew. He sits up here. And his daughter been coming visiting with us for a while. His friend and boss, um, Tim Bird, committed suicide, and um, he said he was a very, very close friend. We want to remember the Bird family in our prayers. Also, if many of you know um, or saw on Facebook, Rhonda McLean, who is a McLean family, they always sat over here. Uh, members here back years ago. John actually worked with Southeastern Children's Home. He was a family counselor and therapist. Took a job. They moved down to their family to Atlanta. And Rhonda passed away on May the 11th at 38 years old. Left two small boys and her husband. And I have no details on what happened. Um, the funeral is this coming Wednesday. Linda and I are going to try. Depends on you know, a lot of factors to go there um, and uh, to the funeral in Atlanta or outside of Atlanta. But remember the McLean family, and I can't think of her husband's name, but uh, there's, I'm sorry? Chad. Chad. Yes, Chad, um, on her passing. Um, but let's uh, go to our Father in prayer before we begin our class. Our Father God in heaven, as we humbly come before your throne, we are so grateful for another Lord's Day. We're thankful for the health and the ability of each one of us that you've given us to be here this morning. We pray that you'll give us open hearts, open minds to receive your word with all gladness and search your scriptures and find the truth in there for us. We pray that you'll be with Miss Joan and it will help her with the pain that she's suffering in. Um, and just... Uh, your will be done in her life, and she will receive the uh, some blessing from you. Pray that she'll be able to be with us. We pray that she'll be with Kathy as she goes another round of chemo. We just are so thankful for her and her faithfulness and willingness to be here. Just pray you'll be with her through this time. We pray for the Bird family and the McLean family and uh, on their loss. Just pray that you'll be with that fa those families. You will comfort them as only you can. And we pray that you will be with me as uh, I direct everyone's minds here this morning and pray that you will speak through me as only you know how and know what people need to receive. We pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Oh, I don't have anything on my screen now, so did you take it off? Just use the clicker? All right, so I'm going to go to my Google Slides on my screen so I can kind of see and read. And we're going to use the clicker this morning. So this is our 12th class, and we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 this morning. Hopefully we will finish chapter 10. If not, we'll finish it next week and get into chapter 11. Um, again, our mantra is... Acts 17, 11, we want to be like those Bereans. We want to receive the word with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures to make sure everything that is ever said is true. We're going to look at some warnings from history. The history of the people of God demonstrates that the enjoyment of high privilege does not guarantee spiritual blessings. If you've been in Martin's Wednesday night class and already talking about with Isaiah and how they're, you know, have strayed from God, even though they had high privilege. And that seems to happen a lot of time. It's interesting, Hegel says, history teaches us that man learns nothing from history. And boy, that sure is true, even in today's society. Unfortunately, in our world, in America, it seems like our government is trying to do away with history. I'm a big history buff. They took, a, from my understanding, all the monuments on Monument Row is now gone outside of Virginia. 
Um, they just took down another historical monument in Asheville uh, last week. So it's very sad that they're removing history um, from all around us. Whoops, I'm not clicking now. I'm sorry. But it doesn't change it, yeah. There we go. We're going to look, think about all the miracles that these people witnessed in Egypt. The ten miracles of the plagues, they experienced all this stuff, they experienced in the wilderness we're going to look at, the cloud by day, the fire by night, the water from the rocks, the manna, um, and yet they still blew it because of their unbelief. Why did the Israelites perish in the wilderness? Was it because of the idol worship? Was it the golden calf? Was it because of the lack of faith of the ten spies? Because my judgment is they didn't believe God could do what he said he could do. They looked at those giants and they said, we're like grasshoppers in our sight. God's, God cannot do his, can't keep his promises. You know, and to me that means lack of faith in God and under belief. I want to ask us, do we believe God keeps his promises? Do we believe his promises? We're going to look at some promises today that apply to us. All right, let's get into chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. This moreover here is kind of like a word, therefore. Michael Grooms used to always say, when there's a therefore, you've got to look back previous to see what it was there for. Well, that's moreover is very similar to that. It means to look at these preceding verses. And remember, chapters and verses were not put into place until the 12th, 13th century or so. So when you read this, if you read it with continuity and flow, Paul buffeted his body in order to keep from being rejected. And, he's, and, and then he flows right into this. Unaware, he wants them to know this for their own good and welfare. You know, this cloud by day, I read this in World Video Bible School and I had never thought about this because I always thought, you know, you got a pillar of fire, it was probably a pillar of a cloud. But it said, protected them from the heat of the day. You know, on the warm sunny day when you've got a nice cloud cover there's a 10 or 15 degree difference in temperature so maybe I don't know I threw that up there because I thought that's interesting I never thought it was a cloud cover to protect them from the heat I always thought it was just a cloud pillar <laughs> so you know it's interesting how our brain thinks in pictures um, <clears throat> so all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea so this experience is called baptism. That word there is baptizo, which means an immersion. They were, because the cloud was over them, the water walls were on the side of them, they were immersed. And it's very interesting that this experience brought them to a new relationship with God through Moses. He became their deliverer from bondage. He became their lawgiver. He became their intercessor between them and God. And he's going to relate that right into a type of Christ. We see in Romans 6, <clears throat> 3 and Galatians 3, 27, when we're baptized into Christ, Christ then becomes their, our deliverer, their deliverer, their savior from bondage of sin, <clears throat> the king, the ruler, whom, he is, whom the person is to obey. The mediator between that person and God and the intercessor through whom he prays um, <clears throat> God through God the Father. Sorry. They all ate the same spiritual food. Verse 3. Manna. It's interesting. The word manna, if you look at Exodus 16, 15, actually means what is it? It's also interesting. God never called it manna. God called it bread. The people called it manna. They saw this stuff. They said, what is it? Manna. I just, interested. you know, these little things are all interesting to me. Jesus is our bread from heaven, John 6, 51, and our water of life in John 4, 10, and 14. All drank the same spiritual drink. They all drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. <clears throat> the rock from which the water did flow did not literally follow them, but the water was always available through the various means. And let's look at Exodus 17.6 and Numbers 28. 17.6, this is at the water at Horeb in Rephidim. It says, Behold, I stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and the water will come out of it. 
that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the Israel's, the elders of Israel. It's interesting, in Numbers 20, this is about 39 years later. You know, we forget the time frame sometimes when we're reading. This is the water at Kildesh Meribah. It says, take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. Now, what did Moses do? He struck that rock instead of speaking for the rock. What happened? He was not allowed to go in the promised land. There was consequences for his actions. But, and if you read on in chapter 12, it says, because you didn't believe me. I find that very interesting. Moses says, did not believe God or he would have obeyed. Biblical belief, biblical faith means you obey. It's a very significant point we need to remember. <clears throat> Have you ever thought about it? I wonder how long Moses would have lived if he had done what God said, been able to go into Canaan. I mean, who knows how long the Lord would have let him live? I, you know, just thoughts I have. Again, I think differently than some people. Yes? You know, you think um, this is towards the end of the chapter. Moses had been faithful to God and obedient to God like he was saying. For 39 years, they're within... One years. mistake! <laughs> And, you know, sometimes we, we look back at our lives and say, but I was, but I was, you know, we've got to be faithful until the end. Right. Revelation 2.10, faithful until death. Yes. And I always think of Hebrews when he talks about the wanderers in the wilderness. In Hebrews 3, 18 and 19, my Bible says, I'm reading from the Nazi, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest but those who were disobedient? So we see they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Unbelief. Those two, they ties unbelief and obedience, which the world wants to untie. Right. Yeah, belief in the world is not obedience. Exactly. Or faith. Yes, Marshall. You ever come to the end of your rope? Moses had been hearing... The griping and complaining for 39 Nine years. years. And we're going to talk about some of that griping <laughs> and, and complaining. He, and I think he <clears throat> just got sick to death of it, yep. like we can. And he said, you know what? I know God told me to speak to it, but I'm going to hit it. I think his anger got in his way. I agree. I think it's truly he was angry, and that's caused him to sin. Right, yeah. He, he got angry and a lot of people would speak to him. Well, you know, I didn't think about it. Maybe he, you know, he did say early on that he would, did not speak well and Aaron was going to be his mouthpiece and maybe he, yeah, just couldn't get the words out. So he took action. I don't know. That's a, 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 hop, a possibility. I, I, I imagine he did, but I don't, we're not told. But I imagine he did because God did allow him to see, and we know he was in heaven because of the transfiguration, which we will talk about in a moment. That rock was Christ. Now, Paul is saying, this is interesting, behind these rocks in Exodus, the true giver of the water was Christ himself. The water giving rock represents Christ as the true rock and this means that Christ was the source of their physical needs just as he was the source of all physical and spiritual needs today. This also is proof of the pre-existence of Christ we read about in John 1, 1 and 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. This shows that Christ was with his people under the old covenant as well as today. Verse 5, but most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Why was God not well pleased? Again, I believe it was their unbelief. But notice this. This is a classic understatement of the Bible. It says, most of them, but how many entered into the promised land? Two, Joshua and Caleb. But most of them... And the Greek word, and I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce that, literally means to be strown down along the ground, lay prostrate in death. 
You know, you know you get, most of you know me, know me, I'm a nerd, I like math. And if you look at Numbers 146, it says there's 603,550 men 20 years and older there. And if you, and I'm not saying there were the equal number of women, but it's for easy math, say there is. So that's 1,207,000 people. And if you divide that by 38, the number of years spent in the wilderness after the curse, that means they were averaging 90 deaths per day. 90 deaths per day. Just think about that. 90 funerals a day. That's just hard to get your head around, isn't it? Being recipients of God's daily provision, they still perished because of unbelief. Bible belief, Bible faith means obedience. Means you've got to be obedient and obey God. Numbers 14, 22 is an interesting verse. It says, because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness have put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice. They didn't. They, think about that. Ten times were told. God, wow, God is patient, isn't he? Yes. Well, some of them were, and we're going to look at some of those as we go, go through this chapter 10. <clears throat> now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. They complained about the food, Numbers 11. They tried God, Psalms 106, 14 and 15. Notice Numbers, read Numbers 11 sometimes. At the end, in 31 through 34, it says that God sent the quail. They were buried in that Kilbroth Hadabob is, means graves of craving with meat still in their teeth. Think about that. They, the, they serve as a warning, as examples to keep us from making the same mistakes they made and suffering the same punishment they suffered. What is the 10th commandment? Actually, I had up there, and I think I got, I'm trying to remember what commentary I got this out of. It says, what is the capstone of the Decalogue? And I changed that to what is the 10th commandment. I said, nobody's going to know what a capstone is. Nobody's going to know what a Decalogue is. <laughs> but the capstone of the Decalogue is the same way of saying the, what's the 10th commandment? What is it? Thou shalt not covet. Exactly. Do you realize covetousness, according to Paul in Colossians 3, the end of verse 5, is idolatry? What's the first commandment? Have no other gods before me, right? Idolatry. The last commandment, he caps it with idolatry, covetousness. Covetousness gives rise to all other sins, according to James 14 and 15. But each of you is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Desires, when we covet stuff and we are enticed. We're going to look at five historical examples for our learning. Coveting of food, engaging in idolatry, committing immorality, testing the Lord, grumbling, complaining, murmuring. It's amazing at the number of verses that are actually talk about that. And this is more than history. These Corinthians were to see their own reflection in the mirror of these historical events. I want to ask you when you read chapter 10, do we see a reflection in the mirror or when we look at the Bible? Or are we looking at our own lives? We got to apply this to us. Verse 7. And do not become idolaters as some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. This is quoted from Exodus 32, 6, and that is where Aaron and the golden calf are at. And if you read that, this describes the festive atmosphere of their idolatrous worship, which was completely immoral and offensive to God. They substituted playtime for prayer time, indulgence for reality. How many of us substitute playtime for prayer time? We need to be thinking about this, don't we? You know, I was reading the average person spends four hours a night watching TV. Wow. We spend four hours a night in prayer? Four hours a night in studying our Bibles. Four nights in communion with God. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Getting back to Scott's point of the miraculous. Now this is an interesting verse. 
<clears throat> this comes from Numbers 25. It says, they, at the institution of Balaam, the Israelites worshiped Baal Peor. They observed the king in the night, fertility rites, and indulged in sexual immoral practices. Now, if you look at verse 9 there of 25, it says, and those who died in the plague were 24,000. Hmm. Was Paul wrong to say 23,000? Did Paul get his numbers right? Was Paul not endowed with the Holy Spirit? I've got any any thoughts about that. People go to this verse and they say, oh, there is a discrepancy in Scripture. The Septuagint and Philo both support the 24,000. I, I was disappointed in World Video Bible School. They didn't really address this. I had to dig deep in some other commentaries that thought, wow. It said, look at the words. Read the Bible. The Bible is the best commentary on itself. What does it say? Paul says, in one day, 23,000 died. Huh? A thousand an hour. Yeah, well, in one day. But notice verse 9 is a total number, 24,000. So you got maybe 1,000 died the next day, 23,000 in one day. That makes perfect sense to me. There's no discrepancy there. I just... You know, again, I bring these things up because if you're confronted with people that say, oh, well, here's a discrepancy, if you just read what it says, it's easy to understand. You know, 23,000, Paul might have had more insight because 23,000 died in one day. But again, 24,000 is the total number that died. So there's no discrepancy at all there. Now let us, now, nor, I'm sorry, nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Now, the better translation says, let us cease from always tempting the Lord. I found that very interesting. How many times do we tempt the Lord? You know, after the defeat of King Arad, if you look at Numbers 21, the people were discouraged because they were traveling around Edom. And they displayed impatience. They spoke against God, against Moses. They said, we loathe this manna. They clamored for water. And what did God do? He sent a plague of fiery serpents among the people. And the people repented. Moses prayed. And God told Moses to make a brazen serpent and put it on a pole. And I mentioned this before. You can read the whole Old Testament and never understand the significance of this brazen serpent, except when you get to Kings and you re read a thousand years later, so they're worshiping it, and then it's destroyed, until you get to John 3, and Jesus explains the brazen serpent, that he would be lifted up, just as the serpent was lift, that brazen serpent was lifted up. Nor complain or murmur, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Look at all those verses that mentioned grumbling or complaining. Like Marshall said, this was a frequent sin. Moses heard grumbling and complaining from the people constantly. How many of us grumble and complain? Do you realize the Lord hates grumbling and complaining? He does not like grumbling and complaining. We've got no reason to grumble and complain. It is a sin. Number 16 is a very, another interesting chapter. You know, the, Charles Clark, I, I, I mention him a lot because he comes to my mind when I'm thinking because of all the things he told us. He said, we can't understand the New Testament if we don't understand the Old Testament. We've got to read it and understand it. They were grumbling, 250, these were leaders, Korah, and these were leaders, these were upper level people their wives and children all died. They were consumed by God. The ground opened up and it sunk down. It says they sunk to the pit. I find that very interesting language because they were challenging Moses. They were like, who, who made you prince over us? And then if you go down to verse 49, it says 14,700 died of a plague. This is the next day. Those people, they just saw these 250 people die and then they're complaining to Moses, and the next day, 14,700, it says, in addition to the 250 that died. Paul focuses on history lessons. One reason, I believe, is to instill respect for spiritual leaders. We can read in Hebrews 7, 13, 7, 17, and 24 about respecting the leaders of the congregation and the eldership. 
Now these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. I mentioned in Martin's class one time as a comment, when the Lord says something twice, you need to pay attention. He said this same thing in verse 6 we just read. Now he's saying the same thing in verse 11. The importance of re learning from history. Learning. God is a God of history. God of the Old Testament is God of the New Testament. He changes not. That is immutable. And He hates sin, yet He loves the sinner. And boy, do we have that messed up in our world. You look at the world out there and they love sin. <laughs> and we sometimes hate the sinner. We have got to be careful to separate those two. Romans 15, 4, Paul says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Again, these all happen as examples for us to learn from. You know, Bible history is divided into three ages or dispensations. You have the patriarchal, the mosaic, and the Christian age, the last days which we are under today. In these dispensations of time, God has set forth specific requirements for His people to worship and serve, and serve Him. And it is so sad that people don't understand this in the world. They don't understand about the three dispensations. They don't understand that God established certain things. When it was the patriarchal age, God took that patriarchal age, He took one family out, or Abraham, he took them out, said he's going to make them a great nation. What happened to all these other people? They became Gentiles. They are still under the patriarchal age. They're still living under that same dispensation, those same rules, except for this one group of the Mosaical age. And then what happened when God made the Christian age? He combined those Gentiles, patriarchal people, and the Mosaic Age into one. And God's commandments of the patriarchal under patriarchal age was not the same as to the Jews under the Mosaical Age under the law of Moses. Neither are God's commands the same under Moses' law as they are for us today. And we must now follow the law of Christ because that is the law we are all currently under today. <coughs> Again, as I mentioned, this is confirmed in Matthew 17 at the Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah appeared. Peter wanted to build three tabernacles, one for each of them. And what happened? God thwarted that plan with these words. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him, Matthew 17, 5. There was a time when man was to listen to Moses and listen to Elijah. But now we must listen to God's son. We cannot be justified by the law of Moses because it is no longer in effect. We see that from Romans 7, 4, Ephesians 2, 14 through 16, Colossians 2, 13 and 14. We are under the law of Christ. 1 Corinthians 9, 21 we looked at, Galatians 6, 2 and James 1, 25. Verse 12, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Wow. What is that talking about? Avoid, misplaced, self-reliance, and inordinate pride. Do you realize God hates pride? And I personally, you know, I try not to interject too much of what Jay thinks in this. I personally think when I was studying the Satan, Satan, and the fall, and, the, and that sort of stuff, that was his sin, was pride. And I think that's why God hates pride so much. It's because of that. Again, that's Jay. You study that for yourself. Take heed lest he fall. The Greek word here, fall, is the aorist tense, and it indicates a complete and final fall. The implication of this fall is as a final fall of those in verses 7 through 10, which we just read. Memory verse, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. And God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. This is where I was talking about promises of God. Do we believe this? What a promise this is. Now again, it's written to the Corinthians, but I believe this is very applicable to us today. And notice, 
such as common demand. There are no trials. Our trials, I'm sorry, are no worse than men have been enduring since time began. Think about it. Adam and Eve, first murder. You know, she lost a son. She actually lost two sons. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's the first, I guess, the trial after being kicked out of the garden. But, you know, trials come. But remember, this too shall pass. Now, God is faithful. God is trustworthy and worthy of trust. He has promised to guard Christians, 2 Thessalonians 3.3. 3. Plus, Christians are told to pray for deliverance in Matthew 6.13. If you read the Lord's Prayer there, He will not allow us to be tempted. You know, God's always on the job. He is stronger than the tempter. I actually had these verses pulled up on my phone, but... Um, You, let's see, 4.4 four says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Notice here, God is not simply a spectator in the affairs of life. You know, a lot of, that's one of the things they think, well, God just set everything in motion and now he's just a spectator. He's just out there. But he is actually concerned and active in the lives of his family, his children, Christians because that's what you are. You are adopted into the family of God when you become a Christian. And withstanding the attacks of Satan with enduring struggle of life is possible if we put on the whole armor of God. If you read that in Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, notice it says, it doesn't say put on a piece of the armor. It says put on the whole armor. But what do we want to do? We might want to put on the helmet and think we're okay. Or we might put on, put on the belt. You know, but we or we don't even wield the sword. Why? Because we don't read it. We don't study it. We don't put it in our head. Because I'm telling you, when you're tempted and Bible verses start popping in your head because they're there, it's so much easier to keep the temptation at bay. Beyond what you are able. This is a very interesting part of the passage. With God's help. God knows the ability of each one to bear the temptations and what we're going under. This also proves that God deals with us individually and implies He makes adjustments to each particular individual's need. Verse 12 of James 1 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised those who love Him. He is not going to tempt us beyond what we are able. But Satan is limited by our ability to resist him with the help of God. We can't resist him if we don't have Scripture at top of mind. We often quote 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. But do you ever read verse 9 right after that? Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same suffering are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Resist him. And then, <clears throat> James 4, 17, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You know, sometimes fleeing is the best thing to do. We need to be fleeing. I mean, we'll look at that. Hopefully we'll get there. We'll also make a way of escape. You know, what is the way of escape? This is not a mirac miraculous or, you know, it's being promised by some means of escape, the temptation. But this is the escape provided in the gospel, the opportunity for choosing to follow God instead of following the way of the world. Remember, well, I'm sorry, it's the next slide. David Lipscomb said, As temptations vary, so the means of escape also vary. We have this verse, perhaps the most practical and therefore the clearest exposition in the Scriptures of free will in relation to God's overruling power. Notice, God makes an open road, but then man must walk in it. God controls circumstances, but man must use them. This is where man's responsibility lies. God does his part, but we have to do our part also. That you may bear it. It is important to note that if man falls, God is not to blame. Men, excuse me, sin by satisfying their own lust. And we see that in James 13 and 14. Men sin by not praying for deliverance. Again, Matthew 6, 13. Temptation that cannot be escaped 
must be endured. Wow, we do not want to think about that, do we? Think about Paul. What did he say? He prayed three times for this thorn in the flesh. And God says, my grace is sufficient for you. He had to endure it. God did not take it away. I think that's an example for us. Sometimes there's going to be struggles. Sometimes there's things that are going to happen in our lives. God's going to just, we're going to have to endure it. That's the only way of escape is through endurance. Temptations, remember, come from Satan. Trials are from God. God does not tempt anyone. We see that again from James 1, 13 and 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee idolatry. Again, Paul loved these people. He was concerned about those people. Flee, present tense. Flee and keep fleeing continually. We read in chapter 6, verse 18. Flee fornication. Again, sometimes fleeing is our best option for temptation. Flee idolatry. Yes. Marshall, what's the definition between testing and trying? <laughs> I just gave it to you. <laughs> I, pretend I'm a fifth grader. <laughs> Temptations come from Satan. That's what's happening. Testing trials, trials come from trials, God. Uh, James is very specific about that. He says trials are there to make us learn what endurance is all about. Trials make us learn what endurance is all about. Makes us stronger. Make us stronger. <clears throat> Temptation causes you to sin. Yeah. Trials make you stronger. How's that? But Jesus said, if you, where, where's that at? Jesus said, if you don't believe me, try me. I'm trying to remember where that well, verse is. I don't remember that one. I have to look it up. But that's true. Tri trials are there to make you stronger. And temptations are there to make you sin. I guess he's talking about it. He's telling you to do something. Try, right. try me to make so I'll bless you. Yeah. I'll have to look at that verse. Yes, Scott. You know, the scripture says God doesn't tempt, uh, tempt people. It says that God cannot be tempted by sin. And so God can't be tempted by sin, right. God can't be tempted by sin. God's not going to tempt us with sin. Exactly. You know, it's interesting. Is fleeing sin even a thought in today's world? I would say not. But that's, again, my thought on that matter. Um, I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. Notice here, this wise is a different Greek word than used in chapter 1. This wise is thoughtful, prudent, mindful to one's interest is what that Greek word means. And he's about to give them a lot of things to think about that we're going to get in. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the, not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? He's kind of getting into the Lord's Supper here, which hopefully we, Lord willing, we will discuss next week. But, you know, we bless. Notice, Paul was in Ephesus when he wrote this letter to the church in Corinth. And he says they're blessed with the same cup. So obviously that's not the container, but the contents of the cup. And here's a reference to the Lord's Supper. Matthew 26, 26 through 29 says, And they, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. I want to make a note about verse 28 there. If you write in your Bibles or you put notes in your uh, digital Bible, put Acts 2.38 beside that verse. And put Acts 2.38, put Matthew 26.28. Because that same verbiage for the remission of sins has to mean the same thing in both verses. Just a side note. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ and the, ble and the bread we break? Is it not communion of the body of Christ? Again, this bread represents the body of Christ. And the Greek word for bread is present tense, which means we continue to break. This is not a one-time event. 
We'll talk about that. You know, the Lord's Supper is the first day of every week for faithful children. Acts 27, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Notice there, partakers, many partakers as opposed to the one bread, the one body, which is the church which Jesus is head of. Ephesians 1, 22, 23, Colossians 1, 18. There's one church which is one body. Those words are synonymous. And there's one bread. <clears throat> the church of Ephesus, the church at Corinth, partook of the one bread. So he says this one bread, we all partake of the one bread, shows they are all unified or the unity in Christ. Ephesians 1, 3, all spiritual blessings are in Christ. Observe Israel after the flesh. How's my time back there? I was looking at the back clock. <laughs> Observe Israel after the flesh. Our, are not those who eat the sacrifices partakers of the altars. Paul's using this Jews under the Old Testament as an example. Part of the animal sacrifice was eaten from the offerer and part was consumed by the altar. So the offerer had communion with the altar. To share with the altar was to worship the God who authorized the worship at the altar. So he's going to go into this offering you know, to idols again and to the flesh. So we will pick up in 19 uh, next week, um, I believe. I will do that. I might change my mind after looking at this because I really wanted to get to chapter 11. <laughs> so um, might let you do, finish 19 through 33 on your own. So anyway, thank you very much. I appreciate everything. Oh, okay. Now I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>